Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. The first black publication in this country was Freedom's Journal. It was founded on March 16, 1827 by the Reverend Samuel Cornish, depicted on the left, and John Russworm on the right. The newspaper is just more than reporting. There's a lot more to it than just uh, going out and getting a piece of, uh, getting a pencil, a pad, right now what you see, and uh, uh, even broadcasting. It's a lot more to um, the newspaper than that. I think a lot of students that uh, go into journalism school, I think that they see the uh, beauty side of it. Guy making a newscast, um, you know, standing out, and it really looks good. The grass really looks green, looks exciting. But it's a lot more to it than that. Hello, I'm Rob Hinton. And I'm Genevieve Stewart. How accountable is the media to the black community? And if white-owned communications media are paying more attention to black people, why is there a need for the black press? We will attempt to answer these questions along with other black representatives in the media as we examine the role of the press and the black press today on Folks. Everybody says folks. Since its beginning in 1827, the black press has been a voice of advocacy for black people. In fact, many say the black press was born for this reason. The first black publication in this country was Freedom's Journal. It was founded on March 16, 1827 by the Reverend Samuel Cornish, depicted on the left, and John Russworm on the right. In the paper's first editorial, Russworm stated, quote, we wish to plead our cause too long have others spoken for us." Unquote. Twenty years later, in Rochester, New York, Frederick Douglass founded the North Star, a paper he said would plead the cause of blacks before all else. In his paper, Douglass stated, quote, The man who has suffered the wrong is the man to demand redress. The man struck is the man to cry out. We must be our own representatives and advocates." Unquote. The Liberator was another famous abolitionist newspaper. Published weekly in Boston from 1831 to 1865, its founder was William Lloyd Gaines, a white man whose city had a system to destroy and not time to waste. Those were three of the most famous black journals in the pre-Civil War era. Today, there are more than 160 black newspapers in this country, going into approximately three million homes. Genevieve, about a decade or so ago, when white-owned media began integrating their staffs and paying more attention to coverage in the black community, many people asked if the black press was still needed. Well, recently I put that question to Reverend Ivory Payne, owner and publisher of the Scotland Press here in Baton Rouge, and he said yes. What I've experienced um, since I've been publishing newspaper, since I started working with the newspaper, in the uh, bigger newspaper, um, there are a lot of... Um, small events that was not covered um, to make up maybe a paragraph of go to the entirety. So if you brought in a press release uh, about uh, your daughter getting married, and, um, uh, about your son is on the football team or whatnot, to the entirety of it, we print it all. Um, people have brought things to me that they wouldn't even put in the state times, say it wasn't worth a while. Well, I wouldn't, you know, make mention of a bigger newspaper, but the, you know, bigger newspaper. So they say it wasn't worth their while of putting it in there. Pictures sometimes be a little bit too dark, but those people who were proud enough to have that done, you know, they're excited when they see it. 
they uh, sent our daughter a picture. Not only I sent our daughter, but our own picture in the newspaper. Plus, in our religious um, section, we have different ministers like to write different articles on Christianity. And I have never seen any appear in the uh, bigger newspapers. Not only that, we, um, we have a, a need for it because we feel that uh, this is free enterprise. And uh, never before do I know of a black man owning a, a major newspaper. So this may be a stepping stone to something greater. Uh, just becoming a weekly responsibility may become a daily. Has the credibility of the black press been ignored? I feel that the black newspapers has been ignored uh, tremendously. And one of um, the means that it has been ignored is because of um, the um, large number, um, well, I say large black population. And um, I note that in adv advertisement, advertising, uh, the only thing that the black newspapers are getting, whiskey and beer, cigarette advertisement, when there are so many different other um, products that blacks are using, that um, it's not um, being um, advertised through the through our publication. Automobiles, it's hard to get an auto, um, a car ad. And if you get one, it's just one, you know. Um, you never get a contract. You get one this week, you gotta get back out there and hit the streets the next week in order to make your quarter to even publish your, your publication. Has the local white community been responsive as advertisers? Not very much. Not very much. Not to the extent where um, I feel into, I feel and believe that the um, the bigger stores have not done um, their share of ad advertising in the black media. What about the black community? The black community, um, not like they should either. So it's, uh, but the black community has been um, pretty much my backbone, my support in the newspaper. Are there opportunities for blacks to work in the black press? I think it is. I think it is. Um, I've also found the, um, I got a lot of um, students that uh, went to journalism school and graduated in journalism. Um, they're interested in just writing or broadcasting. But uh, as far as the newspaper is concerned, um, sales and um, management, they're not interested. I've had, um, I've had run of the mill people coming in, um, graduates, um, in journalism. And what I've seen, they just wasn't interested. The only thing they wanted to do was report. And um, the newspaper is just more than reporting. There's a lot more to it than just uh, going out and getting a piece of, uh, getting a pencil, a pad, right now what you see, and uh, uh, even broadcasting. It's a lot more to um, the newspaper than that. I think a lot of students that uh, going to journalism school, I think that they see the uh, beauty side of it. Guy making a newscast, um, you know, standing out, and it really looks good. The grass really looks green, looks exciting. But it's a lot more to it than that. And after they come in to really see it, see what it's all about, they're running. They want them part of it. What role do blacks play in the press today? Well, today we see blacks working as journalists on daily newspapers and television stations, radio stations. Here to help us continue our discussion on the press and the black press are Yvonne Foreman, a reporter with the B B Morning Advocate here in Baton Rouge, and Sailor Jackson, a photojournalist with WBRZ television station here in Baton Rouge. Welcome to folks, both of you. Thank you. Reverend Payne was right when he said some people feel that the media business is very glamorous, and that's the reason that a lot of students enter journalism. I can surely attest to the fact that it's not glamorous. It's very interesting from day to day, different things from day to day, but it's not glamorous. Yvonne, what are your thoughts about media? Well, you're right, and Reverend Payne was right. There are a lot of blacks who enter journalism school expecting to graduate and get glamorous jobs and do wonderful things, get instant recognition on camera. Most of that comes with broadcast journalism. But there's a lot of work that goes into being a reporter, 
either for the print media or for broadcast. And it takes a lot of work, a lot of preparation, and it, it just takes a, a certain dedication to the work of reporting the news to the people. Sailor, how do you feel? Do you think uh, your field, broadcasting television, is a glamorous business? Um, by no means. Um, as Yvonne said, there's a lot of work involved in it. Um, behind the scenes, I guess you, guess you would say, you have a tendency to uh, um, see things uh, <laughs> as they really are. Uh, you get down, you go out, you do a story. Uh, you may go out and there may not be a story there, and then you have to do your research and make sure that you can come up with uh, uh, that polished appearance once it hits the air. So, no, I don't, I don't really think it's a really glamorous job. As a news gatherer, give us some idea of the routine of your daily activities. Well, basically our day starts like um, we have a, a meeting uh, with everyone there. You have uh, the assignments editor, you, sometimes you'll have the news director and assistant news director, and you have all the reporters and photographers, and we uh, have what is called an assignment sheet. We all go through this uh, and try and brainstorm, as the word goes, as to how we can best uh, present the story or the assignment that's on the sheet. And then from there, the reporter and the photographer hit the streets, and <laughs> there you try to develop your story. You go out and do your interviews. You go out and shoot what we call supporting video to go along with what the reporter might want to say. And from there you come back. And I'm just using this as an example, but you may do more than just one story a day. Uh, you could end up uh, possibly doing three or four. You come back, the reporter has to go ahead on and, and write the story. He gives it to me, I'm an editor, and we go in and we put it together. Uh, I put the pictures to the words as the, as the saying goes, and we try to come up with a polished look. I try to match what he or she has said uh, in a story. Is your daily schedule pretty much the same, or are you around the clock, or give us some idea, Yvonne, how well, you're Well, my schedule. day is somewhat different. Uh, I cover the courts the 19th Judicial District Courts for the Morning Advocate. And I pretty much have a free will at deciding what things that I will cover for the day. I know what things are scheduled to come up on, on the dockets of the courts. And it's just a matter of going around, making contact with the different sections of court, checking to see whether or not those things did go off. Uh, sometimes there are things that are not scheduled. and. It's just making the daily contacts with the judges, with the judges' staff, the district attorney's office, you know, checking uh, court records. And some days it's pretty routine, but there are days when we have a lot of excitement up there, you know, real interesting or one of the bigger criminal trials. I pretty much cover criminal court now. Sailors, speculate for me on something. You've worked in television for a number of years. Let's just use Baton Rouge as an example. Okay. Speculate for me why there are no blacks who are anchor persons for weekday or weekend news on any television station in Baton Rouge. I can't really answer that I'm, because I don't, I don't know the reason. I know that for a fact that there are some qualified people here who would be able to fill those positions. Uh, but as far as why they haven't been hired to do these type of things or to hold these positions, I really couldn't say. Um, and for me to speculate on it to any degree would you know, really be a, um, uh, just a strictly speculation. Okay. Um, in terms of opportunities for you personally, have you felt stifled or have you felt that there have been opportunities for promotion? For me, I don't, I don't feel like there is an opportunity to be promoted in the area where I'm at. I could possibly leave the news department and move into another department. And if you would consider that a promotion, I guess so. But as far as being in the news department, uh, no, I don't, 
I don't see a, a promotion or, or upward mobility in, in that at all. Yvonne, um, I've heard numerous complaints from organizations in the black community, and I recently had a personal experience myself where I took an article to the newspapers about a scholarship activity, a benefit, and the whole nature of the article was changed. It was edited beyond recognition. The name of the organization was changed to that of another organization. Um, when a follow-up article was sent, we were told that they don't give much coverage to benefits, yet the symphony ball was given color photographs and extensive coverage. Can you explain the inequities there? Well, I can only say that the types of articles that are published in each section are really dependent upon the discretion of that editor. Now, there, I can't really explain how your article was changed. Uh, that is not good journalism there, to have the article changed, the name of the organization to be changed. Uh, if there was an error in it, it should have been corrected. You know, that's one of the policies of the paper, if we make a, an error. But a lot of times people don't realize that when they bring in material to be published in the paper from high schools, colleges, organizations, you know, just any group of people, you have to realize that the editors there and those people who are responsible for putting it together to put it in the newspaper will make changes and will conform what you have brought in to the style of the paper. Now, it may not be exactly what you had, but that's because we edit and rewrite all things that go into the paper. I'm sorry that that happened, and I'm sure if you would talk with the editor in charge of that department again, she probably would set something straight with that incident. Let me direct this question to the both of you. Has being black <clears throat> helped or hindered your coverage of the news, particularly as you try to develop sources? Yvonne? Well, I don't think it has hindered me uh, that much. I have been covering courts, Rob, for the past 11 years uh, here in Baton Rouge and in Florida. And I have never expected to receive anything because I was black, although there was a time when I was the only black uh, on the paper, on the staff, and I was sent to mainly black activities. And I never felt uh, belittled by that. I never felt that uh, they were saying that I could only cover black events. Sometimes it takes a black person covering something that uh, concerns black people to bring out the sensitivity of, of the problem to be able to put it down uh, in, in writing. And sometimes uh, you may be the only person that the uh, person you're going to talk to will see. You know, they may not want to talk to anybody. I have never felt that it was a major problem for me being black and developing my sources, because I would like to think that people will accept me and judge me as a good reporter and not as a good black reporter. I want to expand a little bit on the coverage of uh, news in the black community, but I want to go to Sailor first and get your comments. Do you think being black has helped or hindered your coverage of news? Um, I'm somewhat unlike Yvonne. I don't think that it's uh, helped or hindered me one way or the other. Uh, I worked in Monroe for about uh, seven years before I came here. There I was a reporter, and I just think that my personality, and I think that I have a personality where I can go in and develop my contacts and be able to get people to talk to me, not talk to a uh, black person per se, but just talk to me and tell me what I need to know. And yes, uh, during that time, I, I covered a lot of black events. And as, as Yvonne said, uh, there's a certain thing about a black reporter covering a black event that will bring out that sensitivity or a particular issue or point that you're trying to make. And, uh, and being black, uh, it was just fitting for me to go in and do that and uh, really give it a good piece of journalistic uh, know-how, I guess you would say. Since its beginning, the black press has always played the role of the advocate. How much of, a role of that role should you play in covering events and situations as they occur in the black community? 
Well, you have to be careful, Rob, in, in becoming an advocate when you are trying to write uh, objectively. You know, you have, to, you have to write just the facts. You cannot inject your feelings and your personal views in a straight news story unless it is labeled an editorial or an analysis. You have to uh, be able to separate yourself from the issue. It is not always possible to do that. And sometimes I am not able to separate myself from what I am writing about. But the, the one thing that I have found that helps me to do this is to just write this story just to say this is the way it happened and just leave it at that. Now, I can have my own feelings about it one way or another. You know, I, I have covered trials that have lingered on in my mind days after, you know, they're finished because of something that occurred. But in writing a story, what I try to do is I try to convey to the readers the essence of what happened during that trial, and I try to show them both sides of it, a balance of the event. And I think you, you have to do that. You cannot uh, become an advocate for any one thing or another. You, you have to just walk the straight line, so to speak. I wanted to ask Yvonne, um, in terms of the editorial policies of the newspaper, or newspapers in general, not just necessarily in Baton Rouge, but Louisiana, period, would you say that their editorial policies towards the black community are somewhat benign, that they show ignorance, that it's um, a type of neglect, or that they're liberal? Well, I don't think uh, the black community is being neglected uh, so much by the, the, the white, the larger white, uh, predominantly white media. I think what you have is that you have newspapers as well as television, uh, radio stations, who cater to the large masses of people who consume their quantities, their, qua their product, okay? With the newspaper, for some reason, blacks are not very uh, in tune to buying and reading the newspaper. They are not large consumers of the newspaper. So then, if you geared all of your writing and everything to a certain community or a certain group of people or, you know, certain environment, you would, you would be leaving out uh, a lot of people. The, I think the newspaper does a fairly good job in trying to balance uh, the racial thing, you know, balancing between uh, covering things in the black community and covering things you know, in any other community. Well, let me ask you, <clears throat> both of you this. Um, if people in the black community wanted to see more positive coverage of events in the black community, both on television and in the newspapers, but the newspapers wouldn't, criticize, wouldn't print criticisms of themselves, nor would the TV stations necessarily cover criticisms of themselves made by leaders in the black community, where then will we facilitate any change? Would it be through the black press? How can pressures be brought to bear on a media that will not necessarily carry criticisms of itself? Well, we normally carry criticism, you know, of, of things that we have in the paper. It's done through the letters to the editor. Uh, that is one good forum for sounding off. If you are upset or if you don't like something that's in the paper, write a letter to the editor. And in most cases, those letters are printed. You know, if, if you're upset with an article, if you're upset, and a lot of things have been changed at the paper, not only here, but at many other papers, because people wrote letters to the editor. They followed up on something that was in the paper. You don't just read it and say, well, I didn't like that that was in the paper, and I'm not going to read anything else. They followed up. They went to the trouble of writing a letter or calling the editor or, you know, just dropping a note saying, and if enough people did that, uh, a lot of things would change, but we just don't have that spontaneous response that we should have when we don't like something that we see in print. I think the same thing holds true um, on television, too. If you see something that you don't like, 
I think that you should follow it up. And I, mean, I don't mean just make a phone call. Uh, if you want to make a phone call, make a phone call along with writing a letter. And then if there's someone else who also didn't like it and you discuss it, then all of you get together and write a letter or make a phone call. That way you will make your voice known and know that you, you were displeased with whatever it was that you saw. And I think, like Yvonne said, uh, just to say, well, I didn't like that and not do anything about it or not follow it up, that's not the proper way to handle it. You, you have to continually follow up, you know, follow it up to the fullest. Sailor, you and I have worked together, and Yvonne, you've worked in the press. I want you two to tell me if I'm sensitive. Oftentimes when there's a shooting incident or something of that nature and the suspect happens to be black, we often, I know on television here, suspect is black. But when the reverse is, if the suspect happens to be white, we don't oftentimes hear that. Am, am I being overly sensitive, or is that true? Is there I, some truth to that? I think you're being overly sensitive. I know at one point uh, in the history of the newspaper, the white media, there, there was some undisclosed need to point out the race of uh, victims or defendants, suspects, as you call them, in, in the newspaper. But by and large, I don't think you would see that in Morning Advocate or the State Times today, unless it is relevant to the story. You know, if it is relevant to say that uh, a white policeman shot a black woman and the black neighborhood became enraged and were upset about it, well, see, it's relevant to the story, you know. But just to say um, a black man armed robbed a service station where a white attendant was held up, I mean, there's no point to saying that. It has nothing at all to do with the fact that the station was robbed unless it's a description that you're printing, you know, if the police would like to publish a, a description of, of the suspect, you know, you can say, well, he was described as a black male or a white male and the height, weight, you know, and all the other vitals. But I think uh, very seldom do you see in the, in the papers where we identify uh, victims and suspects as black or white unless it's relevant. Well, I take it that I am overly sensitive you, then. You are. Yvonne Saylor, thank you very much for being with us today on Folks. Thank, thank you. you. Genevieve. Thank you very much. We'd like to know your thoughts about today's program. Please send your comments to Folks, care of LPB, 2618 Wooddale Boulevard, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70805. Next week, we will continue our salute to Black History Month with a look at black contributions to the world of sports. We'll also, we'll also have a discussion on the NCAA's controversial Proposal 48. Until next time, so long. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.